man-at-arms, reforged. Today we're making a World War I Jambia knife from Battlefield I. This will be one of the many weapons you can use in the game, available October 21st, 2016. Jambia is Arabic for dagger, but it also refers to a traditional short curved blade originally from Yemen. Jambia knives played a role in the fighting that occurred in the Middle East. There, the British helped spark an Arab uprising against the Ottoman Turks, and the man they sent was T.E. Lawrence, also known as Lawrence of Arabia. The knife we are making today is similar to the one that Lawrence of Arabia himself carried during the war. Crucible steel has been the default way of making steel in the Middle East for over 2,000 years. For the Jambia knife, we chose to use one of the extra parts we made for the Ulfbert episode. So I'm going to forge it out, stretch it into a bar, clip off the amount of material I need, give it a taper, and go to my dies to make the knife. To get this from puck form to bar form, it's gonna take Ilya about six to eight heats. The first step in making our knife handle is getting that top die that will also act as the mandrel cut out in the plasma. John's gonna cut it out of some half inch steel and then Carrie's gonna shape and form it. So John has now put a handle on the back side of what's going to become our stake. That's going to allow me to both put it in the press and put it in the vise later. We've got the shape that we want. Now we have to give it some form. So we're going to grind the surfaces. I'll be using a large wheel that's fairly coarse to remove most of my material. And then a smaller smooth wheel and the slack belt of that to be able to smooth out the entire piece before I go to polish it. Once he has the bar stretched out, he'll select which end he wants to work with, hot cut that material off, and start the blade forging. So to make this handle, we're gonna be working with fine silver. Five ounces of 999 fine. This is an ingot that you could buy at pretty much any coin dealer is gonna have this in stock. And so I'm gonna take it to the press, Kind of work the material a little bit initially uh, before we go to a hand hammer. After the hand hammering, we'll take it to a rolling mill and thin it all the way down to 18 gauge for our final surfaces. Now that the length is established, Billy's gonna use a set of dies underneath the hammer to create that central ridge. Anybody who wants to be a good blacksmith should forget for the first year to make blades or knives or anything else. Don't even look at them, because the most knowledge you pick up is in architectural blacksmithing. This is where those dies come from. They're normally used to make decorative leaves and fencing. However, they're perfect for making that bridge on the Jambia dagger. Some of the more difficult materials we work with require gentle forming. You'll often see us using wooden hammers where you might expect a steel hammer. This is gonna non-mar on the surface, and it's also gonna allow us to drive the piece without putting too much mass behind each blow. Now that we've got our stake to form and then polish, we need to get a pattern off of it. We're gonna create that pattern using painter's tape. That tape's gonna be put over the entire surface of the piece, trimmed down, and then we'll peel that off and that'll give us our pattern for the material that we need and lay that onto the 18 gauge silver and trim it out so that we can get it to fold on these inside radiuses where we don't have too much material. Now that he's gathered enough material and made the blade for this, 
It's gonna draw out the excess, make the tang, and then we'll cut it off to length. Battlefield 1 takes place during World War 1. It made me think of the trenches. This scrap lead is all fired ammunition that we've gotten. You can see there's a lot of copper and other materials in it, some brass from the casings. We're going to melt this at a low temperature and hopefully that'll float to the top on top of the lead. Then we're going to pour as much clean lead as we can into this cookie tin. become our lower die. We'll put it into the press with the upper die, lay that into the molten lead. We'll allow it to cool like that. It'll give us a positive and a negative or a male and female die to form the silver. So now that we have the male and female die set to go, we've got it mounted in the press and pressed into the lead. I'm going to take this, keep the cleaner side down towards the lead. That's going to be our outside. I'm going to press it in here, work it a little bit. After we have these done, we'll do all four of these. They've got to match, so we've got to be able to put them together so the opposite sides come together. Uh, we're probably going to have to take them on the die, work it with a hammer, shrink those edges, make them nice and tight, make them fit up, and then they'll get soldered together. It's now time to start doing the profile grinding and the rough grinding before heat treat. You can see that using those dies really did most of the forming. Ilya took great care in forging the rest of the blade so it's almost to shape. Back in the day, this material would have been so precious. Any loss would have been almost devastating. And it serves a dual purpose, makes the guy who has to grind the blade a lot happier. You'll see that I'm not really refining this blade to shape at this point. I just want to get the outer perimeter set and then get some thicknesses true. Then I'll round the edges just a little bit to make it safe for the heat treat. If you leave the edges really square, it's prone to crack. We really don't want that. Now I'll need to shrink these corners down. I'm gonna do that with a steel hammer and drive the material back down on the stake until I have the proper form. Quite a few medieval sources and modern research papers mention that crucible steel was actually air hardening. The fact is, you don't have to quench it in oil. Some Arabic sources mention a funnel-like construction where wind gets trapped and concentrated. So the smith just heat up the blade and stick it in the wind funnel. I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to heat up this blade and use compressed air to quench it. The good thing about that is, because it's so thick in the center and so thin on the outside, only the edges will get really hard and the center will be relatively soft. That is good because it prevents snapping when the blade is being used. We know this blade is very hard. To make it safe, we're gonna go ahead and temper it. We'll be putting it in the kiln. It'll stay at 400 degrees for about two hours. The Jambia Dagger is a great example of the global scale of World War I, a conflict that started in the Balkans and quickly engulfed the major European powers, including their territories across the globe. Fighting in the desert of the Middle East meant carrying a Jambia at all times. The dagger curves up towards the hilt and can be drawn quickly. This blade may be beautiful, but it's also functional and deadly. We've now reached a point with the silver where every little mark is going to count. I'm going to start by scotch braiding the surface. From here, I'm going to be very careful with the silver as we go. We'll do some soldering, but since it's fine silver, it won't oxidize, and we'll be able to keep this finish as we go through the entire project. Now that our blade's been heat treated and tempered, I can do the final grinding and then move on into the polishing. 
Carrie's also got our first piece of the handle soldered together, so I can get my final whiffs on our shoulder. I'm just gonna neck this in slightly, and then get to grinding. The reason these knives have steep central ridges is so that the edges can stay thin, but the blade is still nice and rigid, which really goes along with Ilya's theory of why these were air hardened. Because you would only need that edge to be hard, the central part has enough mass, doesn't really need to be that hard, and it still stays nice and stiff. Kerry's lead pressing die produces only one shape, this one. However, the corners on this are too square, here and here. So I'm gonna use my stake and my gauntleteer hammer to round them over. The blade is now pretty much to form, but the tip is still rather chunky. So you can see I'm gonna adjust the belts from side to side, be really careful, and refine the tip. If you've noticed up until this point, I haven't touched the center ridge whatsoever. I'm now on a softer wheel and a 120 grit, so I'm gonna start peaking that center ridge very carefully on the edge of the wheel. Then when I move on to the other grits, I'll true it up. So now we've got the handle section. We've got this completely put together, soldered, where we're gonna alter it. This goes down, becomes the guard down near the blade. This will be the pommel piece as I finish these out. But they actually are separated slightly like this. And what they're separated by is a one inch collar. We've got a lead block and a polished steel dowel. I'm just gonna take a bronze hammer and drive it down onto here, put the curl in there, and that's gonna allow me to bring this around, make it flush, do my solder joint, and then I'll have my collar. Getting to be the first one to see these blades out of etch is such an honor, and this pattern is beautiful. Normally, when we fold steel together or forge weld several different types of steel, you see the pattern. In that case, the pattern is a result of several types of steel with several alloys etching at a different rate. Here in crucible steel, the pattern is consisted of a carbide lattice trapped in another steel lattice. It produces a much finer pattern and that is the original steel that was so sought after in medieval times, as well as in the 19th and early 20th centuries. With both halves of the silver now ready to go on this pommel, I've done a few small tack solders in here. I'm gonna solder across the entire line. I'm using hard solder, which is a much higher temperature. It's actually a little bit stronger as well. But the main reason that we use hard solder first, we use a hard solder so that each progressive thing that we attach to the silver is a lower temperature solder, so it doesn't undo the previous work. So we need to create some decorative bezel wire. We're gonna be doing that in fine silver, but it's gonna go around the handle. We've made these little rounds, we poured them. I'm gonna run them through these dies, progressively smaller as I go, until I reach the size that will allow me to go to the decorative roll on top. That'll create the final product, and you'll see it, it really is amazing. Before the handle parts are gold plated, some of the designs already have to be cut in. So I'm going to use my little hammer and my engraving tools to start that. So the ends of this pommel have exact domes made for the ends. What I'm gonna be doing is, I'm gonna be making them out of these discs. They'll go on to here. There's a border that goes around the outside. It'll all get soldered together like the other parts. We're gonna be using this dapping block, working with these silver discs that I made up. I'm gonna come in with something slightly smaller because I have to leave a gap for the thickness of the silver. And that creates a nice, even, rounded end. We're gonna cut this off, and then these get soldered in place with a border. To create the ribbon-like texture on our handle pieces, Ilya is going to use a technique called wriggle work, where he takes a graver in his hand, rocks it back and forth, 
pushes it forward, and it creates that perfect look. So now we have the handle assembled, the bezels that'll hold the stones. These moon stones are already set. So I've sized these bezels right at five millimeter. Pick up a stone, five millimeter dead on. We know we can put that right into a bezel. We're gonna use a beading set and treat it as a bezel pusher. Gonna go right over top, they're domed on the inside. So I'll now go to a slightly smaller one now that I've started the bezel, lay that in, and that'll lock the stone in initially, and then we'll go to the next one. We'll now be laying the gold on the permanently onto the surface. We'll be using an electroplater for this. Uh, we've got a gel compound that has 24 karat gold in it. The electroplater will permanently adhere the gold onto the surface. And that's a different way from what would have been done in the past where you would have used mercury and an amalgam and vapor, which is very dangerous. These daggers were traditionally held together with pitch. Carrie and Illy are going to carefully fill the recess of the handle and then stick the blade in and cool it down. We use cold water to set the pitch. We're now fully assembled. The final thing we have to do is for Ilya to do that last bit of engraving. And the reason we're doing this after plating is because in the game it has a very two-tone look. So we wanted to make sure that the handle was plated gold and that the detail work was carved in silver. Everyone in the shop really enjoys these historical builds. We're really pleased with the way this turned out. Both Matt and Ilya came to me afterwards and started talking about how we would make the next one. As you can see, it's quite a process to make one of these. The high level of craftsmanship is what led these knives to become the treasures they are today. But first and foremost, it's a weapon. So let's go see how well it works. I like this one. Cut straight to the point. Till next time, stay sharp. Thank you to Dice and EA for sponsoring this episode. 